Peru Peru Peppa. Scarlet Nexus is an action RPG developed by Bandai Namco Studios and published by Bandai Namco Entertainment, released in June 2021. This game was produced and directed by a couple of dudes behind the Tales of series. Now, I don't know too much about the Tales of series. I've only played Sisteria and Berseria and I like them a fair bit, and Scarlet Nexus looks like a more action-focused version of those games. As far as action RPGs go, Bandai Namco's been killing it lately with Tales of Arise, released later in the same year as Scarlet Nexus, and Covain a few years back in 2019, getting good reviews, so I have no doubt that this will stimulate my prostate. Let's brain drive down the road into... <sighs> it's Scarlet Nexus. Graphically, this game is fantastic. It's set in a post-apocalyptic sci-fi version of Earth. The ruined buildings and dirty environments mixed with the holographic signs and billboards gives off a unique vibe and I enjoyed going through them. The designs from the characters to the enemies are pretty cool too. It's got that hoodie thing going on with a red and black color scheme which is certainly my type of drip. The monster designs are basically a mix of everyday objects with limbs and animal parts that mix up for a horror aesthetic. That's enough for me to wanna run away. Art-wise, I enjoyed it quite a lot, though I don't think it's a look that most people would be fond of. The colors are a bit muted, so it looks drab at times, and there's a lot of red, but I think the cool designs of everything makes up for it. The game runs pretty well at 1440p at 60fps for me, nothing much to complain about. I found a bug where a sound effect played and kept looping forever until I quit to the main menu. There are some object pop-ins on a certain map, and the TXAA anti-aliasing makes the game a bit blurry, and the other AA options leaves things way more jagged than it should be, so I had to use reshade to sharpen the image up. The story is told through these glorified slideshows and occasionally full motion cutscenes. These two blend together most of the time, which to me just feels weird. It's like when a dev port the main version of a game to a last gen console and because it doesn't have the power to adapt all the visuals, they have to cut corners like turning a what would be a cutscene in the main version into just pictures in the last gen version. I'm fine with both forms on their own. I understand that the budget's gonna run out if every story event is motion captured and animated. Just saying, if you're gonna animate a part of a scene, make the whole thing animated, damn it. Aside from those things, the game is very polished, so props to the devs. Seriously though, what's up with games these days that use temporal anti-aliasing and doesn't give you the option to sharpen the image? Just give us a sharpening slider in the graphics options. It's not that hard, is it? The gameplay loop is pretty simple. You start a chapter, go to a certain location, watch some stories play out, kill some monsters, and go back to your hideout where you can hang out with your teammates. Repeat that 12 times and the game ends, or 24 if you play both characters. Yes, there are two protagonists in Scarlet Nexus. You can play as Yuito, a rich boy who joins the OSF, Other Suppression Force, to fight monsters because an OSF soldier saved them once, and Kasane, a powerful psionic who was scouted for her abilities alongside her sister, Naomi. Each character has their own moveset in combat and perspective in the story, with different storylines for the teammate bond episodes. This is a linear game. You have multiple maps that you can explore with items and materials to collect, but they're not like open world levels, so don't expect that. The combat is stylish, but also a bit stiff. Yuito's moveset consists of his sword and psychokinesis ability. At first, you can only do a 3-hit combo, but you can upgrade it to 5 down the road. You also have a secondary area of effect attack that spins your sword around you, and of course, psychokinesis to throw things at your enemies as long as your psychic gauge is not empty. Kasane's moveset is range based, with her attacks being flying knives controlled by her psychokinesis, which is way cooler than a sword, and the upgrade path is similar to Yuito's. Kasane is the easier character to play as since her attacks have a wider range, and it's always risky to get close to the others. Yes, the monsters are called Other. I'll complain about that in the story section. Anyway, their movesets are cool, very stylish, with effects everywhere. It's cool to look at. I have three complaints about the combat. The enemy lock-on feels loose. When there are multiple enemies, the lock-on system targets the one that's the nearest, but sometimes it doesn't. You can go towards an enemy and hit it once, but for some reason you fly somewhere else in the next. 
It feels really inconsistent and it almost killed me a few times. Even activating manual lock-on doesn't make much of a difference. Next is the fact that there's no dodge cancelling out of attacks. Scarlet Nexus can be a very chaotic game, so being able to reliably dodge is a must. Once you start to attack or do a combo, you have to wait for the animation to finish before you can do anything else. If this game was like a Tails game where combat is not so fast paced, then it would have been alright, but Scarlet Nexus feels more like a character action game like Devil May Cry or Bayonetta. The enemies attack so quickly that you need dodge cancelling to be able to properly react to them. You'll get juggled otherwise, and I'd rather juggle these nuts than be juggled in game. Dodging attacks is not too important since you can just spam healing items, but is it more satisfying to be able to dodge attacks as they come and feel like a badass, or get hit by something and then drink a potion? The enemies can be very damage spongy, like those big slime alligators. You can break their shells first to reveal their weak points, and use psychokinesis to throw heavy objects at them to fuck them up first before actually attacking, but you can run out of heavy objects and get stuck poking at them for 5 minutes straight. You can do a takedown move after depleting their stamina bar if you attack their weak points, but unless the enemy is small, you're still gonna have to whack them for some time, especially if their weak point is well hidden. You can use Brain Field, which is this cool berserk mode that lets you wail on every enemy in the encounter, but it's better to save that for the bosses. Aside from that, the combat is fun enough. There are many enemy types that need you to use a certain teammate's ability to kill them, and you get into this flow of switching to an ally, kill a thing, and then switch to another one to kill another thing, and it just keeps you going, feeling like a badass. This game is not a brainless butt masher, and that's good. Bond episodes are where all the character development is at. At the end of a chapter or phase as the game call it, you go to your hideout and you get to know your teammates. You can talk to them, give them gifts, and even go on short missions to boost their bond level. Every gift you give them becomes a part of the hideout and you can see characters interact with them, which is cool. When their bond level increased, their abilities get a boost in effectiveness, and they can even step in to block attacks for you in combat and do bonus attacks to weaken enemies. The Bond episodes are different depending on which character you play as, with different stories and dialogue. I liked every character, even that little asshole Sheedan I liked at the end. I'm genuinely surprised at how much content there is here. This is one of the best things about the game. Even if you're not here for the story and characters, you can just do them for the rewards and skip all the dialogue, so either way you get something out of it and that's awesome. It's story time, if you don't want spoilers, go to this timestamp to skip. The story is kind of confusing at first with what seems to be a bunch of random shit happening, but it turns into something weird but cool. Let's start with Yurito's route. Yurito is a cadet of the OSF, other suppression force. He wanted to join because an OSF soldier saved him when he was a kid and even gave him a cool earring. At the initiation with his friend Nagi, they get plugged into the city computer, Arahabaki, allowing them to communicate via brain and cool shit like that. Finished with the initiation, the boys go outside to find others invading the city. Yes, the monsters are called the Other. What the fuck were the devs thinking when they thought of this name? The Other? What Other? It's like a bad comedy routine. Hey man, what do you do for a living? Oh, I work for the Other Suppression Force. The Other Suppression Force? Yep, what Other Suppression Force? You know, the Other Suppression Force. What? Don't we only have one suppression force? Yeah, the other suppression force. What other suppression force? It's called the other suppression force. What other suppression force? I don't understand. The, no, that's the name. It's called the other suppression force. Why are you force? yelling at me? I just, I just don't get it. You're being an I'm asshole. I'm just trying to tell you the name. It's called the other suppression force. So apparently there's a forecast system for other attacks, but they weren't able to detect it this time. The top dogs come to defend the city, mainly two dudes named Fubuki and Karen, who are top ranking members called Septentrians. Fubuki starts whooping ass while Karen calls the manager, hoping to get a discount. Yuito and Nagi goes to fight the others, even though they're cadets and they weren't supposed to. They almost get clapped until a familiar looking girl came to help. The others were stopped and the press starts coming in to snap photos, but luckily the crew is teleported by Luca, another Septentrian, and also Karen's younger brother, and the press was led away by Arashi, an OSF soldier who can go fast and is Fubuki's older sister. The girl who helped Yuito is Kasane, the other protagonist, who recently became a cadet with her sister Naomi. The crew goes back to the OSF HQ to meet the rest of the team. There's Shiden who talks shit as soon as you step in, 
There's Kilka and OSF Commander and MILF. I mean, woo wee! Damn! <laughs> Fine. After that, you meet Sato, your OSF Commander. For now. How to be your childhood friend and a user of pyrokinesis, Kagero, a fellow cadet who was scouted late by the OSF and is called an adult <laughs> with a capital A. <laughs> Here comes the terminology again. Wataru, a telepathy user who's the intel support guy of the team. Sugumi, a clairvoyance user who can scout ahead for enemies and see invisible ones along with being able to cheat in CSGO. The gang is split up into small groups to do a training mission in the ruined city of Kikuchiba. This is basically a simple level to get players familiar with the game. You kill some others, fight a boss at the end, but it's too powerful so Seito has to come help and the press comes to fuck again. Everyone goes back to their home city of Suo to see Kyoka's platoon where Yuito meets Kasane again. He asks her if they had met before becoming cadets because she looks very similar to the person who saved Yuito as a kid. Kasane says no and confirms that she doesn't have a sister besides Naomi, so it can't be someone related to her that saved Yuito either. The team goes on a mission to a construction site area to answer a distress call. After killing some others, Yuito finds Arashi, a veteran OSF soldier with a super armor ability, Genma, and then fighting off more others. Of course, the press is there to snap photos and disrupt the mission. Arashi destroys the drones and uses them to kill the others and go back to the hideout to rest. If you do Kasane's Bond episode, Yuito can ask her why she looked familiar. Kasane thinks it might be a realistic dream, which is something a psychokinesis user could have sometimes. Kasane has one where a woman keeps saying red strings, which is an important detail for the plot later. Moving on to the next phase, Yuito blacks out and wakes up at the Sumeragi tomb with no memory of going there. The team calls him and they go on a training mission. After that, the gang goes to the subway to take out some others. The others come from a place called the Extinction Belt. Sometimes the Extinction Belt falls below ground level so others can spawn underground and the OSF has to take care of them. This is where the plot actually starts, kinda. Nearing the end of the mission, Naomi, who has the power of precognition, sends that Kasane is gonna be shot and dives in to block the bullet. The bullet transforms her into another. Another? Another what? <laughs> Kasane falls unconscious after getting attacked by her sister, and Yuito has to fight Naomi. After fighting for a bit, a Seiren soldier comes to teleport Naomi somewhere. Seiren is another city under New Himuka, but now it seems that they're at war or something like that? It's not very clear at this point. Kasane wakes up to chase the soldiers, and Yuito follows. Along the way, Yuito sees Fubuki, who tells him to not let anyone know about Naomi's transformation. Yuito catches up with Kasane who was talking to Karen and was also instructed to not tell anyone about the transformation. Before going after Kasane, Yuito found some ampoules and it looks like Naomi was shot with these and assumed that Seiren was behind this. What are they doing? Who knows. Looks like we got a conspiracy going on here. After the team goes back to Suo, they meet with Nagi again. He was pretty shaken up by what happened to Naomi since he had a crush on her so he had to go to the hospital. When Nagi gets back, he says that it's a shame that Naomi died, but that's not what happened. This man got mind fucked. So we know that Seiren is making man-made others, but New Himuka isn't so clean either. On top of the mind fuck, they got live censoring installed into your vision, and mass surveillance too. It's got the makings of a totalitarian world, except people can still do shit and protest. I don't know what they're going for, but anyway. The gang goes to the Kunat Highway next to kill more others. Genma shows up to yell at Seito, saying that he supports some kind of horrific act. What's happening right now? Kasane's group arrives, but they refuse to fight with Genma since they're allies and everyone runs away. That's when Karen comes in to stop them. Karen gets gangbanged and even though it's his first time fighting Yuito, he says, so it's different this time, implying that he's done this before. Karen blows Yuto away, leaving him to fight alone for a short while. He meets up with Kasane and a very angry Nagi for some reason, and starts to attack them. Seito shows up to knock Nagi out using his electric powers, but it costed his life. Seito dying triggers something inside Kasane since she had a crush on him, and her powers start to resonate with Yuito's, creating a black hole of sorts. Yuito wakes up in some weird, trippy place holding on to Kasane as they slowly fall down. There are red strings everywhere, just like how Kasane described her dreams. 
Inside this place, Yuito sees a piece of the past. One of the founding fathers of Suo, and also one of Yuito's ancestors from 2000 years ago, Yakumo Sumaragi, getting choked to death by someone. That guy looks... familiar. Yuito wakes up to everyone on the ground after an earthquake apparently, but he doesn't remember. The crew goes back to the hideout along with Genma who's a part of the team now. Yuito questions Genma about what he's doing and he says that it's Karen's doing. Karen said that New Himuka is trying to create a more controlled society. So it's not totalitarian yet, but it's getting there. Going back into Suo, we find the city being attacked by others. And upon arriving at the HQ, Yuito sees his father lying on the ground dying with Kasane holding a knife. Yuito is of course conflicted and asks Kasane why she killed him and she starts attacking Yuito. After fighting for a bit, a broadcast appears that shows Karen talking shit about New Himuka and tell people to join him in Seiren instead if they are woke. Seriously, he says if people are awake, they should join him? I almost lost it on that one. Kazane's group runs away and Yuito's group goes back to the hideout. Yuito's obviously sad after seeing his father dead, but he gets cheered up with the power of friendship. Next, Yuito gets a blackout again, but the systems don't show anything wrong. They go to the hospital, but the doctor says it's only exhaustion and prescribes Yuito some medicine. Before leaving, the crew meets a woman with no powers. This is a world like My Hero Academia where most people are born with some kind of power and the minority doesn't. People with no powers are called duds, or in Japanese, bell peppers. I did a double take out my asshole when I heard this. First it's others, now it's bell peppers. What a wonderful game. Oh, this is important to the story by the way. The game gets word of Nagi being spotted at an abandoned hospital and goes to find them. After finding Nagi, Yuito asks him why he's been acting weird, but he doesn't completely know either. All he knows is that New Himuka has been brainwashing people who know too much and turning people into others. Nagi warns the team to get out before the government finds them. Fight a big other on the way out and Fubuki comes to help. Everyone goes outside to a blind spot where the government won't hear them and Fubuki spits some facts. New Himuka used that abandoned hospital to do human testing in order to draw out powers. One of the byproducts of that research is brainwashing. Nagi got brainwashed because he witnessed Naomi turn into another. The rest of the crew wasn't brainwashed because Fubuki promised to monitor them. The other byproduct is a special material used to transform humans into others. So it's not Seiren turning people into others, it's New Himuka. And Seiren just takes man-made others for their own purposes, I guess. Luka takes the gang somewhere else to talk about what he knows about metamorphosed humans. Fubuki's fiance, Alice, who's also Hanabi's aunt, metamorphosed and so he and Karen investigated what happened and that led them to discovering what New Himuka is doing. Since the Sumeragi family basically leads New Himuka, that means Yuito's family is involved. The conversation quickly gets interrupted by Kasane, who still refuses to talk for some reason and attacks Yuito. After some swinging, Kasane reveals that she knows about what New Himuka is doing and wants revenge, or so she says. Then some hoe called Kodama comes in and gives Yuto his medicine, which looks exactly like the ampoules used to turn Naomi into another. The gang goes back to the hideout to rest. Something weird at this point in the story that happens is that in Bond episodes you still talk to members of Kasane's group. They're supposed to be fighting and yet you still hang out with them drinking soda. <laughs> It's kind of funny when you think about it, but yeah, just something to point out. Yuito wakes up after a nap, and Rotaru calls in to inform the crew that a survey team has investigated the black hole at Kunat Highway and named it the Kunat Gate. Fubuki comes to visit and he plans to find out why New Himuka wants so much power. Karen joins Seiren for the same goal, but Fubuki thinks destroying them from the inside is the best move. The crew also wants to know what's happening, so they're now going against the government. While attempting to touch grass, Yuito has another blackout, but this time it's really bad because the game played a pre-render video that was longer than the others, and also a big other is attacking the crew and Yuito has headaches right now so he can't fight. With no other choice, Yuito took a gamble and drank the medicine Kodama gave him and it works. With Yuito looking okay, everyone goes back to work. Sugumi spots a couple of Seiren trucks, but Kakiro and Kyoka starts attacking them to stall them until the trucks are gone. Sugumi is good at her job though, and tracks the trucks back to a Seiren lab of sorts. Luka finds a box with a human head inside and everyone goes on to find out more about this facility. At the end of the level, the gang finds even more human heads in boxes, along with ampoules. 
Kasane's team pops in and Arashi explains that this facility is run by her family and are using human heads to make their products. So that means earlier Yuto drank brain juice to stop his headaches. That's beautiful. After a very chaotic battle, Kasane decides to let Yuto know what's up. Seiren is actually putting human brains into others so they can control them and use whatever is left to make drugs or feed others. Apparently, the drugs made from brain juice can be used on man-made others to let them regain their human consciousness for a bit. Since Kasane's sister Naomi can use the drugs and the research can possibly turn her back, she decided to join Seiren. Cameron joins Seiren for the same reason as Kasane except it's for Alice. Before Yurito can acquire any more info, he gets a headache, Arashi triggers an alarm and everyone leaves. The team meets up with Fubuki for more info. They discuss about everything that happened so far and starts questioning the government. What if they're hiding what the Extinction Belt and the others really are? The game wants to find some proper evidence to expose the government and goes back to the old hospital to get Nagi's lost memories of his brainwashing and Naomi's metamorphose and upload it to the Aura Habaki for everyone to see. Wait, couldn't they just extract the memories of the crew for evidence or is that not a thing? They fight Nagi, but he got more brain surgery and starts attacking. Nagi kicks everyone's ass and Yuito gets a vision of his mom before getting dragged into some kind of chamber and some dude just walks in talking shit. Yuito was about to get gassed, but Fubuki comes in just in time to free him. Reunited with everyone, the crew fights their way out to find Karen, informing Yuito of his now traitor status and offers to let everyone join Seiren. They argue about morality and shit and jokes about them joining Togetsu, which is this religious faction in the mountains, and the crew goes back to their hideout. Before escaping the hospital, Yuito found out that he was born a bell pepper and that his power was artificially engineered. It is also the reason why he gets headaches. Everyone thanks him for telling the truth but friendship never breaks and they move on. Yuito wants to go to Togetsu for help since New Himuka and Seiren are both fucked in the head. The government's and everyone goes to check them out. Togetsu is a moon worshipping religion who aims to go back to the moon. Upon entering Togetsu, the team gets greeted by these weird women in tight ass clothes who were expecting them to come for some reason. Everyone goes into this room with books that activate this hologram of Kyoka? Everyone's confused about that and the hologram says that Kyoka is one of the many clones or design children of Hito Yopope, the founder of Togetsu. This is when we learn about the moon people and where a lot of exposition starts dumping ass. Humans actually lived on earth before 2000 years ago, when New Himuka was first founded. Humans had to go to the moon because earth's environment became unsuitable to live in. When earth was inhabitable again, the moon selected a group of people called Ark down to colonize it. That means there's still people on the moon, but nobody knows about them and because of the extinction belt, no one on earth can communicate with the moon. The people of New Himuka were taught that the extinction belt appeared when they first started colonizing the country, but the hologram says it actually appeared after the country was founded. On top of that, others appeared long before the extinction belt appeared. The gang wants to know where the others came from, but the hologram said fuck off and tells them to access Babe for more info. There goes the names again, oh boy. Before leaving, the hologram has info on the Kunet Gate. The gate expands on a daily basis and will eventually suck and eat the whole planet. It responds to Yuto's power, so it's basically implying that killing Yuto might be able to stop the gate. Yuto thinks back to why Kasane has been trying to kill him and connected the dots. In the end, there's still no proof so the gang goes to find the Babe terminal. Yuto tries to access Babe and it starts to take over his brain. Kasane brain called Yuto to snap him out of it and Luka teleports him away. Before leaving, Luka overrides all the doors and fights some Togetsu ladies. Knocking out a couple of them on the way out, their masks fall off to reveal faces that are identical to Kasane and Kyoka's. So Kasane is also a design children. Design child? I, I don't... After getting out of Togetsu, Yuito's team meets up with Kasane's team to exchange information. First, Kasane clears up on why she was trying to kill Yuito. Back when the Kunet Gate first appeared, Kasane traveled 50 years into the future along with Kyoka, Arashi, and Shiden and met an older Yurito. Turns out Kasane's red strings allows her to time travel and Yurito has the same power. When Kasane's red strings triggered at the highway, it resonated with Yurito and created the Kunet Gate. Yurito doesn't actually have psychokinesis, he has gravikinesis and it only looks like psychokinesis and when it becomes powerful enough it becomes red strings, which allows them to time travel. 
Anyway, apparently Kyoka was actually a design children spy for Togetsu to watch over Kasane. Oh, and the rest strings is made by Hitoyo Pope, the founder of Togetsu by the way. But it's all good now since they dealt with that off screen. Yuito tells Kasane's team about the moon people and Kagero confirms it to be true since he's one of the colonists that came from the moon. Kagero has been in cold sleep for a very long time, but Togetsu puts him out of cold sleep to check on Earth once in a while and report back to the moon. Wait, they can contact the moon even though the extinction belt is there, so they do have a way to contact the moon? I think we have plot holes. Amongst the colonists, the ones who want to stay on Earth join New Himuka, while the ones who don't form Togetsu. With the extinction belt blocking contact to the moon, Togetsu wants the power of the red strings to go back in time and stop the colonization of Earth. Also, Togetsu believed that the red strings has the ability to take only a portion of the universe back in time, so time traveling doesn't affect everyone. Since Kasane is a design children, she was created with red strings, so it's weird that Yurito has the same thing when he's not a design children. Anyway, Kagero defected because he met his wife when he was selected to become a colonist, so if Togetsu erases the colonization, it would also erase his meeting with his wife, thus erasing the existence of his family. After exchanging info, the team split up and go back to their hideouts. Yuito thought about killing himself to save the world, but he doesn't want to give up on finding another solution and asks the gang for help. Gemma is relieved, like, hey man, I don't want to do some assisted suicide type shit, bo a la mao. Yuito wants to speak to his brother Kaito, who has taken their father's place as the chairman, I guess, to confirm some info. Upon walking into Suo, Nagi is there to greet them and decides to tear ass. After the fight, Nagi's brain overloaded from the brainwashing and dies in Yuito's arms. Okay, I know this is supposed to be tragic, but I just didn't care about Nagi. It's tragic that he gets fucked over for watching his crush get turned into another, but we didn't get to know him that well and all he did was talk shit and kick my ass in an abandoned hospital. The point is, I'm glad that he died. The crew put Nagi in a body bag and head straight to Kaito. Yuto questions Kaito about everything that's happened so far. Kaito knows about the moon people and used Nagi to get Yuito's graphic kinesis. Kaito needs Yuito's powers to fulfill Yakumo Sumeragi's wish to get revenge on the moon people. Colonists weren't sent back to Earth just for colonization reasons, but to also reduce the population of the moon since it's full. To stop colonists from going back to the moon, the moon people made the extinction belt and sealed them on Earth. Yakumo swore that one day New Himuka will destroy the extinction belt and attack the moon, and that plan was passed down to the family for generations. Since Yuito's powers weren't powerful enough to move the extinction belt, Kaito wants to use the brains of New Himuka citizens, possibly killing them. Yuto points out that it's dumb as hell to honor the wish of a dead man and Kaito yelled at him and said Yakumo is alive in the Sumeragi family tomb in cold sleep. Kaito wants to honor the Sumeragi name by fulfilling Yakumo's wish, while Yuto wants to be a man and do the right thing and not kill a bunch of innocent people. An alarm triggers and the crew leaves to meet with Wataru. Wataru recorded the whole conversation and the crew wants to broadcast the entire thing for Suo to see so they head for the Arahabaki. At the Arahabaki, Yuito uploads the footage for everyone to see, and Karen comes out of nowhere to take his powers. Karen has the power to copy other people's powers by touching them. After the fight, Karen shot out cables from Arahabaki into everyone to copy their powers somehow. Karen copied red strings from Yuito, and before leaving, he says let's try this again, meaning he's been time traveling this whole time, trying to do some shit. Yuito passes out and goes into his brain field, I guess, to see all his memories slowly shattering. Before fully forgetting himself and everyone, a vision of Kasane tells him to live restores everything. Yuito wakes up with Hanabi crying on top of him, something that I can never have in my life. <laughs> Kasane arrives with her team to explain what happened. Karen, before coming to Arahabaki, copied Kasane's power so he needs to copy both Yuito and Kasane's power to time travel. Everyone sensed that Yuto was losing his memories and Kasane got the idea of restoring them using everyone else's. He also got his old memory back since somehow he connected to an external server somewhere. Don't know what that's about. The crew heads back to Suo to see all the citizens angry and shit, and Fubuki shows up, successfully escaping from the hospital. Turns out Karen saved them and was taken in by Seiren. Fubuki tells Yuito that Togetsu sent some people after him and he convinced Siren to fight against Togetsu. Everyone decides to go back to the hideout but not before Fubuki face plants into the ground from sleep deprivation. Very relatable. 
Back at the hideout, Yuito notices Kyoka talking to Kagero about him. Fubuki wakes up and is asked to be a go-between for New Himuka and Seiren to ask for a ceasefire and focus on taking down Togetsu. Before the game goes to Togetsu, Kagero wants to speak to Yuito and they head to the construction site. Kagero confesses that he killed Yuito's father but won't tell him why, so Yuito beats his ass until he does. Kagero wants to take down Togetsu from the inside, but to not arouse any suspicion, he had to kill Chairman Sumeragi to prove his loyalty. And there's also the whole thing about not letting his family disappear and shit. Kagero then explains where others came from, and it's definitely no penis and vagina bullshit. After the colonists landed on Earth, a comet flew by that left behind something called Other Particles, and the gravity of the moon and Earth pulled the particles onto their surfaces. It turns any living creature into a metamorphosed monster, and the moon has already been affected. Kagero did what he had to do, and Yuito understands that, so they made up and they head to Togetsu to get the babe. Along the way, Yuito informs Katsane's team of his former Dutch status, and that his powers might go away because of that. But Katsane says it's just an assumption and they move on. One very long level later, everyone arrives at the babe entrance and is greeted by a hologram of Yuto's mom, who's also Kasane's mom? What? Babe made the hologram in Yuto's and Kasane's mom's image to trick them. Turns out that their mom Wakana was also a clone design children person. She ran away to Suo, met Chairman Sumeragi, and was taken in because of her Togetsu connections. Fucked and had Yuito. She fostered Kasane when she was first born in Togetsu. Anyway, the two aren't so easily deceived though and tells the hologram to fuck off. Their surroundings begin to collapse and they escape into the babe room and then gets chased by this centipede looking abomination. Hey yo, tempo run. Everyone gets to the babe computer but all the data has been wiped so they'll have no ideas on how to stop the Kunat gate. Then Luga gets the idea of traveling back in time and talk to Wakana, Yuito and Kasane's mom, for info since she knows all about the red strings. The game goes to the Kunat gate where Kasane travels back to the past to talk to Wakana. We cut to Yuito as a kid, play hide and seek with Wakana before Kasane appears. Wakana recognizes Kasane and says that she received a vision from the future of Kasane in Togetsu and apparently the brains of all red strings users are connected to Babe and it uses that to transfer memories across time. This explains how Yuito restored his memories of his past earlier. Wakana has all of Babe's data in her brain so she knows how to stop the Kunat gate. She also confirms that Yuto's death will close the Kunite gate, but she made preparations to stop it and asks Kasane to take her to the future. Also, also, she made an earring that helped prevent Yuto from getting brain damage, which was used when they were in Arahabaki. Young Yuito just leaves for some reason and almost gets killed by another, but Kasane jumps in just in time to stop it and gives Yuto the earring. Or ear cuff. Yeah, it's ear cuff. This is the moment when Yuito got his graphic kinesis indicated by the light purple glow around him as Kasane jumped above him. Now we've come full circle. Kasane takes Wakana back to the present and everyone goes back to the hideout to rest because mommy is tired. After Wakana is awake, the gang goes back to the Kunite gate to shut it down. Wakana explains that once someone time travels it creates an entanglement within the gate and they need to be untangled to shut the whole thing down. Yuito and Kasane works together to untangle the knots. A vision popped up of one that we've seen earlier with Yakumo getting choked to death, and the one who choked them is Karen, which was kind of obvious the first time because of his silhouette, but now it's confirmed. Anyway, the kids finishes their job and goes back to speak with mom one last time before she goes back. There's a certain kind of catharsis in scenes like these, meeting dead loved ones for one last time and say what you couldn't say when they were still around. Life only goes downhill. <laughs> because of time traveling, Wakana has to go back to the past and die to untangle the entanglement. She uses the brainwash machine to pop her brain so Togetsu can recover it, but its memories of the future are gone. Even though the entanglements were undone, the Kunite gate is still up. The one other person who time traveled is Karen, and he needs to be found. The group discuss about the vision of Yakumo and Karen. Kagero remembers that Yakumo never had a mask on until he was injured and ever since then his personality changed, so it could be that Karen replaced Yakumo when he traveled back in time. There's no way to check, but Yuito remembers what Kaito said about Yakumo being alive and in cold sleep. 
so going to the Sumeragi tomb is the next best bet. Everyone arrives at the grave and goes inside. A brain field activates inside the tomb for some reason, and the crew has to fight through it. Along the way, visions of Karen's past start to pop up, so this is Karen's brain field. The visions show Karen and Fubuki and Alice, Fubuki's fiance and Hanabi's aunt if you don't remember. They see Alice not fucking with Fubuki but instead blushing when with Karen. Yo, somebody's getting cucked here, man. Alice was metamorphosed like Luca mentioned way back, but what we didn't know was Karen's relationship with Alice was like. Now it makes more sense. Wait, so Karen calls all this trouble just for pussy? Motherfucker better show up soon or I'ma make sure he never getting any pussy ever again. After another very long and repetitive level, we finally get out of Karen's brain field. A Yakumo's family quests, cold sleep, pot, thing, he descends beside Karen. Yakumo takes his mask off and he was indeed Karen. Yakumo Karen asks Karen why he's here, and Karen says he tried to travel back in time 2000 years but was rejected. Karen wants to know why it failed, and Yakumo Karen says he helped Karen at the Arahabaki, but then he stares at Yurito like he fucked it up. Okay? Then Karen sucked Yakumo Karen into himself. Now Karen knows what Yakumo Karen knows, and it looks like he realized that he needs Yuito's and Kasane's powers to time travel. Okay, so I guess he's one of the multiple Karens that we've been seeing throughout the game, and he's the one who first realizes that he needs both Yuito's and Kasane's powers to use red strings. Karen tries to copy both Yuito's and Kasane's powers, but Luka and Arashi steps in to block him with friendship. They fight Karen, and then he turns into this hologram of four big oni dudes with fans and flowers and shit, and fight him in a very cool boss fight actually. You gotta use everyone's powers to beat Karen's ass and bonk him with the horny bat. In Karen's last ditch effort to isolate Yuto and get his power, the gang uses the power of friendship, popping up one by one, and Karen's ass gets clapped by a big cube. Karen still refuses to give up on bringing back Alice and you can see his desperation and what Alice means to him. Too bad Alice is not even a character so I don't really care about their relationship. Fubuki comes in to convince Karen to stop, like she was his fiance and even he didn't try this hard to bring her back. Also why is Alice Fubuki's fiance? I don't remember seeing him give two fucks about Alice, so it makes more sense for her to be Karen's fiance instead. Anyway, Karen tries to throw hands again, but Fubuki stops him, followed by a hologram of Alice holding him back. Life sucks penis, but you gotta deal with it. Yuito and Kasane ask Karen for help, using their experience of losing their mother to relate to him. Karen agrees and says the Kunai gate shouldn't be closed without throwing in the extinction bell first, it's too valuable. Karen suggests using the Arohabaki to raise the cap of everyone's brain capacity by connecting to it since apparently it's a biocomputer so we don't have to sacrifice a bunch of people to do it. Wait, does that mean Kaito doesn't know about this? Is he a dumbass or am I the dumbass for missing something here? The man wants to kill a bunch of people instead of just using a computer. <laughs> Alright. At the Kunat gate, the crew drags the extinction belt inside it. But before going in to untangle the entanglementus, Karen takes the red strings to go back in time for one more ride. This time, Karen sacrifices himself to save Alice. Don't know what he did, but it worked. The OSF soldiers arrive along with the now resurrected Alice, though she doesn't remember Karen anymore. Along with his life, memories of Karen also disappeared, remembered only by the ones present at the Kunat gate. At the end, everyone gathers at Karen's grave to discuss plans for the future or whatever else. Before leaving, Yuito talks to Kasane about the future. Yuito wants to change the world, and that means going to college and becoming a politician. Kasane wants to go to the moon, possibly to figure out what this other particles thing is. No matter what happens, they will keep on living until the end, and will never be alone because of the connection they share. The game ends with a shot of a red string that ties their hands together, signifying the connection, and they all lived happily ever after. The end. Now onto Kasane's route, and I'll keep it short this time. Kasane's route is basically just Yuito's, except we actually see everything that Kasane mentioned. We see old man Yuito, Kasane's relationship with Naomi, which is way more impactful than Nagi with Yuito, and there are even some levels unique to her. Oh, and did I mention the Bond episodes are all different too? Yeah, they're all different. 
There's just enough here to make a separate campaign. It's not necessary to do both, since you get the same overall story, but it does feel like a more full experience to see everything instead of just hearing like half of it. Scarlet Nexus is one of those stories that seems confusing at first, but if you do decide to dive into it, it's fairly interesting and entertaining. The premise is actually pretty simple, but it's the many little details that made the story seem more complex than it is. It's essentially about a group of people trying to stop a black hole from sucking up the world while fighting monsters, but some dude who craved a certain type of pussy stood in the way of that, so they clapped his cheeks with the power of friendship. The time travel is not the popular multiverse type we're used to seeing today, which you might think it would be less confusing, but yeah, no, not really. It's also different in the way that this is a time travel story that's already been solved. What I mean is that the struggle to get the perfect future has already been done. Usually in a time travel story you see the protagonist struggle to get the outcome they want in the present or future by changing their actions or certain events in the past. In Scarlet Nexus, the heroes already failed to stop the Kunad Gate, Karen already failed who knows how many times to save Alice, and Wakana already figured out how to stop the Kunad Gate without killing Yuito. For me, the struggle to get the perfect ending is half the fun of a time travel story. Seeing that struggle makes you care about the characters and the connections that they share, and there's not a lot of it in the main story. Bond episodes is the main form of character development, but they're optional so unless you have the time to put into a visual novel, you probably won't be going into those, and unfortunately that's gonna be the majority of people. I guess you can look at this as a government conspiracy thriller that happens to have time travel in it, but even then, government turning people into monsters and screwing with the brains of its citizens isn't all that interesting or new. The execution of the story is just okay. It certainly has its moments and there are some cool world building and themes, but that's about it for me. Scarlet Nexus is a good game, but certainly not without its flaws. The graphics are cool with a nice art style, but anti-aliasing makes everything either too blurry or jagged, and the inconsistent style of the cutscenes makes my dick soft. The game generally runs well only with a couple of minor bugs. The combat is fun and stylish, but it could use some more balancing and polish. The story seems more complex than it is, but it has some nice world building and character development in the form of Bond episodes if you want it. This is a solid action RPG with a decent story. It's nothing too mind blowing, though it definitely tried. I finished the game in about 31 hours, seeing almost all the Bond episodes, and beating the game as both protagonists. Definitely get this one on sale if it sounds interesting. I don't know why I made this video so long. I guess once in a while I like to torture myself for no reason. That's been happening a lot lately. Ah, oh, fuck. But hey, thanks for watching. Remember to do the liking and subbing and all the YouTube shit. I'm going to bed now, so see you next time, whenever that is. Later.